Hi everyone, this is video 9A of the Regents Chemistry Curriculum and today we're going to be talking about the penetration and ionization power of different radioactive particles such as alpha, beta and gamma and we're also going to distinguish between fission and fusion and the, uh, we're going to talk a little bit also about the uses of different radioactive isotopes. Uh, by the end of this video you're going to be able to identify the uses of different radioactive isotopes, you're going to describe how fission can be used to generate electricity and you're also going to be able to uh, assess the risk of being exposed to alpha, beta, or gamma. Here are uh, some statements. Read them, pause the video, read them, determine whether they're true or false. If you don't know the answer, that's okay. Uh, you should be able to answer or determine whether this, these statements are true or false by the end of this video. So let's get started. Here we are. Table N and Table O are used to answer most nuclear chemistry questions. Table O shows the most commonly decayed particles, alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha has the most mass, therefore the lowest penetration power. It makes sense. If something is very big, it would have a very low penetration power. It will not be able to go through stuff. Think of a very, very a big object that you're trying to push out of a small window, obviously the object will not be able to penetrate its way through the window. But if you have a small skinnier object, it'll be able to go through. So alpha, it has the most mass, so it's the heaviest. Therefore, it will, be able to it will not be able to penetrate through small uh, spaces. Alpha also has the highest charge, therefore the most ionization power. So let's take a look at what ionization power is. Uh, to, alpha is most likely to, to, to cause harm when it goes into a system because a system usually would have a, a very balanced charge. The positives and the negatives are balanced. Uh, the system's at equilibrium. Uh, if you bring in a, an alpha particle into the system, you could really influence how the system is going to react because alpha particles have a charge of plus two. So these alpha particles can attach to these, to, to, to the negative ions in a system and really cause an imbalance. Beta particles are negatively charged. They could also cause an imbalance in a system and they could also be harmful. So beta particles, the negatively charged particles, they're going to uh, attach to the positive ions in a system and also create an imbalance. So alpha and beta are the most ionizing, where alpha is actually more ionizing than beta, and uh, therefore alpha will cause more harm. However, keep in mind that alpha it has a mass of four, so it's very big. So even though it causes the most harm, it's very unlikely that it will actually mix it, that it will it would make its way into an object because it's very big so it's very hard for it to penetrate uh, it cannot even penetrate through a piece of paper that's how big alpha is uh, now on the other side of the spect spectrum we could talk a little bit about gamma so gamma it has a charge of zero and a mass of zero gamma will go through pretty much anything it could be stopped by a lead block but gamma could go through anything uh, or a lot of things, actually. I don't want to say anything. It could go through a lot of things, uh, but uh, it cannot ionize. It cannot disturb a system that's at equilibrium. It cannot uh, attach itself to a negative ion or a positive ion. The reason why is because it has a zero charge. The charge is zero. Okay, the mass is zero, so it goes through everything, but it does not really cause any harm. So, or it does not cause as much harm as alpha would. So. Uh, Alpha is the, in conclusion, alpha is the least harmful uh, and, no, alpha is the most harmful and gamma is the least harmful. It's a little tricky here. Alpha is the most harmful and gamma is the least harmful. And alpha has the lowest penetration while gamma has the highest penetration. Okay. You can read more about this. This is pretty much what I just said right here.
so here's more about how you can separate radioactive particles. So the alpha will attach itself to the negative because alpha is positive, and the beta will attach itself to the positive because beta is negative. Uh, you can look at table O right here. You'll see uh, on table O, the masses are always on top. Keep in mind, mass on top, mass on top, mass on top. And the charges are at the bottom. So here, alpha has a charge of 2. Here's a symbol for alpha as well. Beta, charge of negative 1, symbol for beta. Gamma, charge of 0. And the mass is on top, charges at the bottom. Mass on top, charges at the bottom. Mass on top, charge is at the bottom. Okay. Moving on. Isotopes which number of protons does not equal their number of neutrons are also known as unstable radioactive nuclei. They have unstable radioactive nuclei. So the protons, if the protons do not equal the number of neutrons, the number of protons does not equal the number of neutrons, you have an unstable nucleus. And if this nucleus is unstable, what's it going to do? It's going to decay. We can look at table N, it's going to produce either alpha, beta, or gamma, or positron particles, as shown on table N, decay modes. It's going to produce various different particles, and it's going to continue to produce those particles until it decays into a stable form. Okay. We can calculate the number of neutrons of an isotope by using the MAN formula. Mass minus atom number equals neutrons. For example, there are 143 neutrons in the nucleus of a uranium-235 atom. How did I calculate that? The mass of uranium-235 is 235 minus 92. And 92 is the atom number of uranium on the periodic table. Take a look over here. Here's your periodic table. Uranium is right here all the way at the bottom as part of the actinides. It has a atom number of 92, which means it has 92 protons. And then 235 minus 92 tells you that you have 143 neutrons. So 92 protons do not equal 143 neutrons. Therefore, your uranium is an unstable, uranium-235 is an unstable isotope and will more likely decay. Okay, we talked about this. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about fission and fusion. So fission is actually the process uh, that is used here on Earth to generate enough heat that will uh, turn uh, generators and uh, will cause will create electricity will help us create electricity so uh i believe indian point if uh, if you can get a tour to indian point you'll be able to in new york uh, you'll be able to uh see uh how we use uh, nuclear chemistry to create electricity so let's talk a little bit about the difference between fission and fusion Fusion requires you to combine two light hydrogen isotopes to make a heavier helium isotope. You combine two light hydrogen isotopes to make a heavier helium isotope. So H1, H, H2, H3, combine them to make helium. While fission requires you to bombard a uranium atom. This is very hard to see, but I, I, I showed it previously. So here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So this would be fusion. Combining deuterium and tritium, which are simply just H2 and H3, in a fusion process to create helium. Here is fission. You take uranium-235. You bombard it with a neutron to create uranium-236 which is very unstable and will decay into krypton and barium.
and produce a whole lot of energy. All right. Let's go back to here. You need a whole lot of energy to initiate the fusion reaction. Why? Because fusion is actually trying to combine two positive hydrogen atoms. And we know that like charges repel. So this positive is going to go that way and this positive is going to go that way. You have to force them to combine together to create helium. So a lot of energy is needed. For fission, it doesn't require as much energy to take place. Fusion is more likely to produce a whole lot of energy. So even though it requires a lot of energy, it is still exothermic and it's going to, it's going to produce a lot of energy. The energy that we get in stars such as the sun is the kind of energy we're talking about here. For fission, uh, it releases energy, a little less than fusion, not as much as fusion, but uh, a lot more than what you could possibly release out of a chemical reaction, like out of a simple combustion uh, reaction. When it comes to waste, fusion is considered a clean process. You're not going to get any radioactive waste from fusion. While fission, uh, you get a lot of radioactive waste, and we have a problem with fission because uh, all these uh, radioactive rods that are used in uh, nuclear power plants have to be stored in facilities uh, for a long period of time until they're completely uh, safe to be released into the environment. So storage is an issue uh, when it comes to uh, doing a fission reactions. Okay, we talked about this. You can't really do fusion on Earth. Uh, you'll destroy Earth. Uh, when it comes to uses, we already talked about uh, how fusion is uh, present in the sun and the star, and uh, fission help us actually create electricity. And it's also used to create uh, nuclear bombs. Okay, when it comes to uses of uh, radioisotopes, here you can read this. This is all just reading and general knowledge. Remember this, uh, when we use a radioactive isotope for medical purposes, uh, that radioactive isotope has to have a very short half-life, which means that that radioactive isotope has to decay out of the body very quickly. So a very short half-life would be something like, uh, let's go back to the reference table, let's look at table N. If you look at iodine-131, uh, if I put 100 grams of iodine-131 inside your body, uh, in to eight days, you'll only have 50 grams left. And in 16 days, obviously, you'll have 25 grams left, and so on. So that amount just keeps on decreasing. We'll talk more about half-lives in the next video. Okay. If we're using uh, radioactive isotopes for industrial purposes, such as, uh, let's say I'm using it for a smoke detector, then uh, I may want it to have a longer half-life because uh, I don't want it to expire right away. Okay, going on to the, uh, moving on to the next thing. Let's read this. A lot of information here. Okay. And there's a lot more information here. Read that, familiarize yourself with that uh, information here because uh, you're going to have to be able to uh, answer questions on the regions about that. So you're going to get a question that says, why, why would you use carbon-14? Well, you'd use it to date fossils. What is iodine-131 used for? To treat thyroid disorders. These, specifically these, they'll come on the regions a lot. All right, with that said, that's pretty much uh, all I have for you today. Uh, let's 
go to the questions again. Read those questions, uh, read those statements, determine whether they're true or false. And thank you.